So, as we're recording, I'd like to welcome everybody to this York Centre for Writing event um, in conversation with Jamie McGarry and Rosie Driffel, <coughs> co-hosted by me. I'm Helen Pleasance. I'm a senior lecturer in creative writing here at York St John and co-hosted by my colleague, Dr. Rob O'Connor, who we are very lucky to have now as a permanent member of staff as our creative industry specialist on the creative writing team. So we are a dream team for this event, which is part about publishing, part about memoir. And our guests tonight are Jamie McGarry from Valley Press. So I'm going to use those epithets that you, you can disparage on your website. So Northern small independent press based in Scarborough, but much more than that. The thing I like on your website, I'm going to click on your website. The description that I really like, Jamie, of Valley Press. Is that it's built on one very important belief. Great literature and great publishing is for everyone and anyone. We don't want any reader to feel like an outsider with their nose pressed against the glass of the literary world. So I think when, when you discuss you know, your ideas behind the Valley Press, which you've now been running full time for 10 years and started a little earlier than that when you were a student. So a career in publishing over over 12 years. And then we will move on to talk to Rosie. So Rosie Driffel is a writer and psychotherapist based in Harrogate. And she has just published, make it out with the shine on my screen, Suddenly While Living, her illness memoir was published with Valley Press this January. <laughs> and the blurb on the back tells us that it is that suddenly while living Rosie's but while living Rosie's body stopped too ill to function as she did before and with a trail of baffled doctors in her wake Rosie works to find new meaning in this roller coaster we call life taking us along for the ride breaking down the walls between memoir self-help comedy and poetry suddenly while living is Rosie's telling of her first year with her mystery illness as she grapples with love loss religion and of course her health so this evening, we're going to split the time between talking to Jamie about Valley Press then talking to Rosie about her memoir. Um, and as it's a centre for a centre for writing event, I feel like this, which, you know, in York St John, that the creative writing team see the centre for writing as a real hub for creative writing. And, yeah, I think we're very lucky that Jamie McGarry and Rosie, are, and Rosie Driffle are part of that hub. So we've done... Jamie has worked with us on various projects. You may have seen him talking last week at our... Um, launch event for Beyond the Walls, our student anthology, which we have published with Valley Press for the last few years, and another project, another research project, Science Fiction for Survival, publishes its anthology, Terra 2, with Valley Press. Um, Rosie is a graduate of both our MA and our MFA. Suddenly While Living was developed whilst on the MFA with us. So I feel this event really does kind of, it, it does feel like a, a proper centre for writing event. But anyway, we'll come on to that again towards the end, kind of like this role of kind of the university publisher and writers. Uh, but without more ado, I'll pass over to my colleague, Rob, who's going to be in conversation with Jamie for about 20 minutes. And we're going to have a short reading from Rosie to kind of launch um, Suddenly While Living. And then I'll talk with Rosie about the book. And then hopefully come, Jamie will come back in at the end and we'll talk about that relationship between publisher and writer. OK, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Helen. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rob O'Connor. I am lecturer in creative writing and creative industries here at York St. John University. So it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight at this uh, lunch event. And yeah, so I'm, we're aware that we may well have some publishing students at this event. We may well have um, some people who have never experienced Valley Press before. Um, so we thought we'd take this opportunity just to maybe talk to uh, Jamie McGarry a little bit as well. Um, Jamie is the head publisher and founder of Valley Press. Um, worked very closely with Jamie in the past, not only as Helen highlighted on um, the Beyond the Walls anthology, the student anthology, but also in my role as chairman for York Literature Festival as well. So I've worked with Jamie quite a lot in the past. It's my pleasure to be speaking to Jamie again. Um, yeah, so Jamie is the head publisher and founder of Valley Press, um, the le Yorkshire's leading independent publisher based in Scarborough. And he's been publishing books um, since 1994-ish um, and using the name Valley Press since 2008. Uh, good evening, Jamie. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're well. E evening, Rob. Um, that, 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 um, that statement about Yorkshire's leading independent publisher. Well, well, I always wonder what's the source for that. Um, 
Um, the source is me. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was like, yeah, brilliant. We'll keep it up. <laughs> if you want to add that to Wikipedia, that would be. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I can start, just, um, I'm aware that some people might not be too familiar with Valley Press. They might have come here um, as um, as um, new exposure to Valley Press. So I was wondering if you spent um, first question with you, give us some insight into the development of Valley Press. How did it all come about? Um, what inspired you? to be a publisher rather than a writer. I think that's probably quite an interesting thing to discuss with you as well. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, well, um, when, when, the, when Rob said uh, 1994, obviously I was actually, I was, uh, I was six years old in 1994, um, but that was, with, with help from my year one teacher, that was, the, that was the time when I first sort of, I mean, it, it, what the product I created was a book, it was bound with those, um, tags and it, it was printed <laughs> off on a computer so it was I mean and it, it was on card it was card covers so it was yeah so I say that's my first book and uh, and I kept doing a lot of people write um write a little story in a book and then draw some drawings on it um and then they get the only way when, when they're in infant school the way, way you could tell that it, I was getting a bit weird about it was that I drew the barcode on and, and I had <laughs> ISBN number on the back um so looking back that was the clue I suppose and um yeah, it would be, yeah, and I, and I, yeah, I do enjoy writing, and I, and I wrote, and I kept making books all through my childhood and youth, and if I had a project, like a secondary school, I would, at one time I was given a project, a writing project, and I presented it as a perfect bound paperback. Wow. Um, just to, um, just because I, just as I could, uh, and eventually, I mean, yeah, and then I kept writing, and um, I, uh, at some point, I realised I got more of a buzz from it was I was writing so I had something to put in a book um, because yeah. I got more of a buzz from producing the book and seeing seeing it come together. Um, whereas, yeah, it's normally the yeah. So so then I realised that I didn't have to um, <laughs> I didn't have to, to write all the books. But there were many other people with lots of things. Yeah, and I and uh, I stopped writing. I wrote my last creative bit of writing. Um, pretty much the same month I started full-time publishing. And, oh, uh, that's, that's really interesting. So you really did make that very distinct choice to stop your own writing, move into, into publishing yeah, it instead. It wasn't on purpose. I, um, it just, the urge left me, or, or the part of me that needed a creative outlet was, was filled, fulfilled enough with the publishing. Um, and you know, Maybe it'll come back, maybe it won't. Um, uh, we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. But I start. Uh, yeah, so I started using the words Valley Press um, during university to make what I was doing seem a bit more legit. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the, yeah, there's a uh, yeah, there's a difference between being like an English student printing books and then and then just giving yourself a name uh, named after the road I lived on. It's named after Valley Road in Scarborough, um, where I still live. I'm still mm -hmm. a stone's throw from it. Um, and uh, yeah, those are Valley Gardens, the Valley Bridge, isn't it? All oh, that's the area. So yeah, started publishing books when I was at university as an undergraduate, and then um, when I, yeah, I graduated and uh, struggled to find a job, or I didn't want to, or I couldn't do the working for free in London route, um, and uh, there wasn't so there's a it's slightly more doable now. There's more schemes and bursaries and and, and really because thanks to the effort of um, the publishing industry. There's still yeah. lots to put in some more effort, but yeah, they've done some good work on that. But yeah, at the time there was, it was I find it very difficult to get my foot in the door. Um, so I just kept, I kept going. I thought if I do this, I really sort of give it my all, like all my energy, seven days a week. Then, you know, maybe in a decade I'll be able to earn a decent wage. <laughs> that was the, <laughs> and that is the, that's the short version. That's a long answer to your first question. Though. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's really, it's, it's really interesting. I think there's lots of, lots of really interesting elements to that, and I, I do find it interesting, Jamie, how you did make a semi-deliberate choice to move into publishing and and not writing, and actually how you found creative outlet through the production of books, which is something that hopefully um, the MA publishing students at St John's are beginning to learn as well. How that's actually a really good outlet for creative. There's a lot more, I mean, there's a lot more, this, this is going to sound harsh, especially for any writers listening, but there's a lot more need for publishers than writers. You know, I, I mean, 
if I when when in the days when we had um, open submissions and, and didn't you know, charge for them, we would get three a day. If it had been open all year, I would have had a thousand manuscripts a year, and, and nine hundred of them almost you know not not embarrassing you know that we could have put out and sold some copy. So yeah, I mean all writers know that there's not enough publishers to go around. And um, that's why I, I encourage everyone to everyone who, who thinks they might like it to give it a try. And, uh... No, excellent, excellent. Um, do you have a kind of key mission statement or maybe a mantra uh, that that you apply to your publishing list at Valley Press? Is there something you're looking for, or, or, or a kind of ethos that you want to follow, perhaps? I think. Uh, well, Helen Helen mentioned um, one of the things I, I wrote that. Um, that, that text on the website um, quite a long time ago. I think it was 2015. So when she started to read from it, she was, I was thinking, I hope she's going to say something I still believe. <laughs> um, <laughs> but luckily she did. So that's good. Yeah, the thing about the thing about the, the books being for, for everyone, I like to think that the, the perfect Valley Press book is worthy of, is, it's, it's, it's sort of literary enough to be worthy of like study on a, um, undergraduate creative writing class but also um or your English lit class but also that you can give it to almost anyone you can give it to anyone on the street who can read and they can get something from it and yeah. they can learn something or enjoy get a laugh or, or uh, whatever response is needed that is the dream it's very hard to achieve both those things um and I also like the I realized uh, a couple of years ago that I also like books that are done earnestly um, and this is this means that the writer is writing them because they sort of have sort of have to. Mm -hmm. We don't have any writers who are writing because they think, oh, I'll follow this trend and uh, what what's selling at the moment? Oh, I'll knock one of those out. I mean, the you know, the, 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 the thing against those writers, some of them are very, <laughs> yeah, um, but um, some of them are very good. But um, yeah, it's it's there's a sort of well, we're getting. I think you'll find out what I mean by that when we talk to Rose a bit later. But there's, kind of a, there's a passion behind it. There's a lack of cynicism. I like to think behind. I would say I was pretty confident every Valley Press book there is. No, I think I, yeah. I mean, certainly the Valley Press books that I've read and I'm familiar with are completely, completely mirror that sentiment. Um, there's a real urgency and passion behind the writing that's going on within those books. Um, and it's not necessarily about um, sales driving or something like that or making lots of money. It's more about trying to get that story out there and that narrative out there, uh, which I suppose leads into my next question a little bit, which is um, maybe your thoughts on independent publishers rather than um, conglomerate publishers or, or the larger, more traditional publishers, perhaps. And I wonder, and I want, I wonder whether you think there are pros and maybe cons as well to being um, a, a smaller independent publisher in the in, in the current contemporary industry. Do you think there's advantages to that? Maybe something to do with the relationship between author and publisher. Is is, is the things that you can pinpoint that you think are definitely an advantage? Uh, yeah. So advantages to well, yeah. The advantages to working with a small publisher are there's definitely less pressure um, because we're so much smaller than your know, conglomerate publishers. We, you know, it's, 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 it's always been pretty much the case that if our book sell, if a book with ours sells 500 copies, we say that's pretty good. And, that, and then we have got enough to pay everyone next year. But, uh, but maybe if um, a book at a conglomerate sells that many, then it's when they go, well, we've, we've failed and the shareholders are furious. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think it's in that case, a lot of um, independent publishers, and of course, a lot of them are. Um, well, we haven't been for a while, but a lot of them uh, receive um, funding from other sources, you know, uh, the Arts Council or something. And there's less, yeah, there's less um, pressure for to make a profit, and it's more about the. It's, it's sort of they they choose the books that are sort of best or, or most interesting, and then they go, now how are we going to sell them? Whereas perhaps a uh, conglomerate, they, they they the salespeople have the first meeting and they go, what can we sell? And then they send it to the editor. I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't actually worked in a, in a, in a big publisher, but you imagine that they say, or they even the agents before they even make it to a big publisher, they say, what's going to sell? Now, how can we make this? Then they send the editors, make this good. 
<laughs> I suppose. So that's the edit. Yeah, so that's it. So editorial first rather than sales first. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting and a and a great way to summarize that um that dynamic, I think, between independent publishers within the industry. How even some independent publishers allow authors to to you know completely bypass the agent stage and, and go and submit directly to them, for instance. Yes. Well, and it, I mean, it's not, I mean, some of the big publishers are doing amazing work. Um, and it's just different pressure. I mean, um, I, last time I spoke to a conglomerate publisher on any kind of detail, I think they said their yearly rent for their office was a third of a million pounds uh, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, I mean, and that's, uh, that's, it's big business. And you, yeah. And you can't do sort of quirky little, if you spend all the year doing quirky little poetry pamphlets, then you also um, have to pay that, then there's only one result. So that's it. We need, we need all strong. Yeah. Um, how much, how much input do you have on each book? I mean, um, I mean, I know you're, you're pretty hands-on, but you might want to kind of just um, tell, tell the people in the audience about how hands-on you actually are, Jamie. Do you do everything? Uh, I certainly did. I mean, yeah, in, um, when I started, obviously, I did everything because there was no way I could. Um, I, 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 there was no money at all. I started with literally no money and I bought, ordered the first print run on my credit card. Um, <laughs> As but, a lot uh, of yeah. independent publishers do, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that was good. And then, um, uh, yeah, it was so, uh, yes, I've been, I've been full time since January 2011 and I had my first part time staff member in 2015. So there's a good few years where it was just me. And, uh, mm. and now I'm very lucky to have um, uh, six people on the payroll, including me. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm no longer as hands-on as I used to be, but it depends on the book. I mean, with Rosie's, with Rosie's book, um, I, did, I did do a couple of editorial. I certainly did a, a portion of the editorial work, both the sort of structure and the copy editing. And, um, and I designed the cover. The, the cover is my idea. I didn't draw the drawing. Yeah. And there's, uh, I, I'd only get a chance to edit a few books a year. And uh, there's a poetry collection coming out um, next month called Particles of Wonder, where the, and I really love this, I don't have time to do a lot of this, but the author sent me everything he'd written over the last, since his last collection, which came out in 2016. So here's all the poems I've written in the last um, four years. So it came from like, like when you buy a print, a print of <laughs> through the post. And I, and I to, and uh, it was my job to sort through and recommend <laughs> what should be in the book, and also put them in order. So I spread them all out on my living room floor. And there's a there's a poem in um, there's a poem in that book where I, I wrote. I mean, I don't, I'm sure you won't mind me saying this. I wrote the last line because um, he couldn't think of the last line. So and I sort of said, "How about this?" So that that's and I, uh, yeah, that is uh, that is quite hand on editing one. Uh, <laughs> that's that's absolutely amazing what what you know that that really is an example of practical hands-on getting stuck in there with editorial that's great but talking about rose's book is is perhaps a nice segue and i should say anybody who does want to ask any questions about publishing please put them into the q a box um we will um monitor, monitor that and perhaps put those questions to jamie or myself at the end but as a kind of segue into and into Rosie, perhaps I could just get um, some input from Jamie about what attracted you to Rosie as a writer and uh, her novel manuscript that came through. What was it just that grabbed your attention? Uh, well, um, we, we, it's uh, interesting this because we, we, uh, I've known of Rosie for a while. She's, uh, she's been writing for a long time and she's sent in, uh, she's, got a, she's got a poetry collection, a couple of poetry collections. They, uh, or in the earlier forms, they came in through our submissions um, windows in the past and didn't quite make it to the onto into print um, yet, but she's still working on it. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, eventually, um, oh yeah, I think I offered a special uh, deal where you could have an afternoon of editorial attention um, for uh, thirty pounds. So it was like an hour. You can sit down and talk to me for an hour, thirty pounds. Um, and uh, and Rose was good enough to pay the uh, and came to Scarborough and she told me about this book. Um, and uh, I didn't say, yes, we'll take it on the day, um, but that was, and this was almost before, I mean, she'll tell you about this, this was almost before she'd finished it, um, and uh, and then when it, uh, and then yeah, then when it eventually arrived, um, 
it's uh, I mean it's it's it's, it's, it's non fiction and there's poetry in there as well and, and there's also some sort of uh, just some jokes yeah you know? <laughs> and it's a, it's it's a serious book um, but it's not it, it could also be put in the humor section so it's a uh, it's a very complicated book but it really ticks some of those boxes I talked about earlier yeah it's, Rosie writes it like um you know you'll you'll find out what I mean but it's it's, it's she needed to write it. Um, and, uh, and I thought that one of the things that is the other thing I always think, I thought that we could we could work on this book and there's not another publisher who could do a better job. Mm. Uh, and that sounds big headed, but sometimes I see a book and I think eh, someone else could do better. That's, so that'd be better off at um, a Blue Moose or somewhere. Um, but I thought we can do this and uh, we can do, we can, there won't be any better a product mm. elsewhere. And that was one of the um, yeah that was one of the seal the seal of the deal I suppose. I think I think that's a fantastic a, fanta a fantastic moment to hand over for the rest of the evening. But thank you, Jamie, for that insight. Um, Jamie and I will uh, mute ourselves so there's no interference. But I'll hand over to Helen, who will be uh, carry on talking to Rosie. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thanks both Jamie and Rob. Yeah, I can see a couple of questions have come in already for you. So yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll hold all the questions till the end. So yeah, questions for Jamie, Rob, and now for Rosie. So I think we've, we've had we've had quite a couple of little teases about your book here. That it's quirky, it's funny, it's got lots of different elements to it. So I think without more ado, I think you should read us an extract, Rosie. And yeah, if you want to contextualise it at all before you do so, yeah, feel free just, you know, to tell us, you know, yeah. Yeah, I think obviously writing an illness memoir, it's kind of fairly self-explanatory what the ideas behind the book were. But, you know, if there's anything you want to kind of say just before and then if you read something and then we can really get into the into the teeth of, uh, of talking about memoir writing. Yes. Thank you, Helen. And, and thank you for your introduction as well. That was, that was very generous. Um, and. I think it's it's probably quite fitting uh, that I do just take a second to to say thank you to Helen personally because um, I'm not sure how many members uh, many members of our audience would know but Helen was actually my supervisor um, I, I did a lot of the memoir as part and parcel of a, a project um, that eventually became my MFA through York St John writing so Helen was kind of instrumental in its development really probably as much as Jamie was um, in in sort of raising my awareness of, of other memoirists and, and also kind of identifying blind spots that, that I wasn't aware of. So thank you to you, Helen. And also thank you to um, some of my York St. John peers. I don't know if you're there, um, William and Emma and Catherine, uh, who worked kind of tirelessly alongside me as we all did really just kind of uh, molding and tweaking each other's works. So I don't know if you're there, uh, but hello if you are and thank you for your input as well. Um, I'd like to read a chapter uh, based on based on fatigue. That's the title, um, and I think it's quite important that we we sort of shine a, a light on fatigue as a, as a as an entity as a concept. Um, my experience of, of that kind of have it living through an illness that that was sort of chronic, but but let's use the term medically mysterious. You know, it wasn't it didn't have a particularly clear cause or a clear trajectory. Um, my sort of experience of fatigue within that was was possibly one of the most debilitating elements and I, I know a lot of people who even if even if one, their diagnosis is kind of more clearly mappable and, and more straightforward in, in medical terms fatigue is, is can still manifest within that and I think it's something that really kind of it's quite unfathomable still within the medical world um, and I, I felt it was quite fitting to read a chapter on that sort of in maybe almost in homage to a lot of people who are going through long COVID at the moment, you know, fatigue is a massive element of that. And I think we possibly not downplay it as a society, but maybe try and make it relatable because it's sort of, it's on a continuum with tired and, and knackered and things we can relate to. Um, so I, I wanted to write a chapter about fatigue and, and how it was kind of different. And I, I felt it might, that's kind of a, a big center point in the book anyway. So um, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to read this short chapter if that, that feels okay. Um, anybody who wants to read along with me, I don't know if you've got the book, it's actually on page 71. Um, I quite like to read along as I'm being read to. I don't know if that's a weird quirk of mine, but if you would like to. Um, okay, so uh, fatigue is not the same as feeling tired. 
said terms might rattle around in the same thesaurus department, but fatigue, uh, the word that I elect to denote what I experience, but only because doctors use it and you get it in medical pamphlets and stuff, uh, is a different species. If, if I could invent a term, it would be something like quagmired to fuck. Because I remember good old tired. I used to be just like everyone else. Tired is not being able to sleep until three in the morning and then having to wake up to your alarm at seven. Tired is spending all day lugging furniture and then not being right asked about the pub quiz. Tired is staring at a screen all day and then your auntie video calls you to show you the new kitchen tiles she's had fitted. And then there's very tired, maybe straying into exhausted, uh, like after a long and painful divorce or after two consecutive exams, three consecutive nights at a festival, working long hours between one hellish commute and another or weeks at a loved one's bedside, weeks praying they'll be spared. Whatever they mean to you, tired and exhausted are words that we commonly use to explain states which, while frustrating and sometimes unpleasant, have a, a clear and identifiable cause that can eventually be overcome. And the act of overcoming may not always equate to a good night's sleep or several good nights sleep. It can sometimes be unexpected, arbitrary, like a brisk walk or hair of the dog or a total omission of red meat or caffeine or a decision to consume only red meat and caffeine. I use the words tired and exhausted sometimes because they have traction with people. People know them. It's clunky and unnatural to tell people that no, I couldn't go to Leanne's hosiery and pork pie party in the end because I was fatigued, not tired or exhausted. Because this thing, this, this hideous, twisted fiend of a thing is devilishly difficult to relate to as far as human experience goes. There's no springing back. There's no, yeah, go on, then I'll have a shot of tequila. You never know, it might pet me up, ha, ha, ha. There's no fresh air or sunshine remedy. There's no caffeine quick fix. There's no easy way of making it relatable, understandable. Only by sending you back to a time when you had the worst flu and someone told you to go to work but on the way to work, a horse and an iron statue fell on top of you, but you still had to go to work anyway, while dragging said objects, might I begin to explain what illness-induced fatigue is like. Every moment, every, sorry, every movement is accounted for, weighed up for its merit, and if deemed entirely necessary to the day's events, executed with extreme care and caution. Too liberal an approach can, but to activity can wipe you out of next week. Good days happen, sometimes you get away with stuff, but these are the exception. Tired tells you to rest or change your circumstances. Fatigue bears no such wisdom. Fatigue will have you rest and change everything, but will still remain a shadow in the light or else darkness itself. Oh, thanks, Rosie. Yeah, that was a, a great chapter to choose. That was one of the chapters that I'd identified that I wanted to talk to you about. As um, So yeah, so again, yeah, this is an, as an opening question, I suppose, because one of the things, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge memoir fan. One of the reasons I supervise Rosie is because I'm kind of, we were matched as kind of mem as memoirists, um, is memoir as a form. So obviously I think there's this idea, I think that, you know, anybody can write a memoir because we've all got, you know, stuff has happened to us. And, you know, even if it's just to process it for ourselves, we might want to write about it. But I think that sometimes belies the artfulness of it, the artfulness of memoir as a form. And so I just kind of wanted to, wanted to maybe just talk to you a little bit about you were writing this in real time. So you were writing about things as they happened to you. And so in some it wasn't kind of an illness that had happened to you and you knew what had happened. Part of, you know, obviously the kind of the difficulty of it, but also the interest of it was that you were writing about something and you didn't know where the narrative arc was going. So, yeah, what, what, how, how did that kind of shape the book? Well, Helen, I think... It, um... That's a really good question. And I think in answer to, to your, your kind of second point about what was it like to write in real time rather than have a sort of circular, clean narrative in mind before I wrote the memoir, um, it sort of felt fairer in a way to, to write in real time because A, when I started writing, um, there wasn't that intention that this is going to be a memoir and, and I'll kind of come on to talk about that a bit more uh, as we go on but it was kind of like well I'm going to write in real time and I'm going to see where this goes because 
I, sp I sort of hope my readership is going to be made up of people who are probably experiencing the same thing. So whether that's chronic illness or, or maybe an illness that doesn't quite fit that, this is going to be your trajectory. You're going to take this medicine and then you're going to have this period of recovery. You know, it, it felt fairer to those people to write something that was messy and, and you know, the form of which kind of reflected that um, sort of fragmented, non-linear uh, kind of process which chronic illness is really so I was kind of prepared to do that and I was sort of it just felt more fitting it felt a lot fairer to write without that sort of denouement kind of in mind really um, in terms of memoir itself I mean you and I Helen we had a lot of conversations about this didn't we as I was writing um, it's very interesting when we read fiction and we we imagine that it's all fantasy it's all not real and that we read memoir and we imagine it's all kind of true and it's sort of blurring those lines between those two things I, I did write in earnest you know what I wrote was true but of course it was edited it was you know stuff was moved around stuff has to be sort of put through that filter of, of this is going to be a literary piece rather than a you know a biography of I did this today and then I did that and I felt great about it you know it had to kind of it had to go through that process as well so um, I, I think what I hoped for the memoir is that it would feel like a sort of literary entity and that it wasn't just going to be, I'm going to tell you everything that happened. It has to be more, I'm going to lead the reader to this point and, and maybe have them infer something about it themselves. Um, and I hope, I hope that sort of comes across that kind of what we call showing rather than telling element to it, I think sets memoir apart from something which might be more of a diary. Um, for instance, so I, my, my sort of hope is that I achieved that in the book and didn't insult readers in just giving them a, a sort of a list of, you know, what was happening to be to me day by day. I wanted it to be a bit more all embracing than that. Yeah, no, it, it definitely is. I mean, again, I think um, I'm, I'm again, I think I think sometimes people think of memoir in two ways. They're, they're either on the side of, well, it's just somebody writing about me, me, me. It's, you know, the eternal I, you know, those upstanding eyes of memoir, I, I, I. And it's kind of, it's a selfish form of writing, whereas I'm absolutely in the opposite camp, whereas I think memoir, good memoir, um, is a is an utterly generous form of writing. It's kind of, it's the writer making themselves vulnerable on the page, sharing with readers and inviting readers to, to, th to think about their own experiences through the memoirist experiences. And I know that was, I know that was one of your intentions behind the book. It was kind of, you know, one of your intended readerships was, you know, people who have had unexplained illnesses and or, or, cr or chronic illnesses and kind of and inviting to kind of share that experience. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, it's you, you can't sort of fashion a readership for yourself as a writer, but you can hope for what one might look like. And it was certainly my intention was to write sort of for those people um, and, and almost give voice. And, and I really hope that my, my book represents or at least goes some way towards representing what that experience is like um, because it, it kind of occurred to me maybe at the point when I decided I'd like this to be a memoir that there weren't that many people doing that you know it was kind of Helen you, you were very generous in sort of alerting me to all these sickness memoirists let's let's call them sort of for, as a shorthand um, but what tended to happen in those memoirs and not to be sort of in any way facetious about it but either those people had a terminal illness and, and you knew that eventually sadly they were going to die um or they they were ill and then they got better and I was like there doesn't seem to be much out there telling the story of what it's like to sort of be ill and not know how long you're going to be ill for and, and I thought going back to what Jamie said and I can't remember if it was Jamie or Rob that used this word but the urgency um of I've really got to write something that speaks to that experience of what it's like to, to be poorly but not know what's going to happen to you I knew I wasn't going to die but I sort of thought what what what's my life going to look like what 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 is living going to be like and can we talk about that and can we you know give a voice to that as a, as a memoir form so I really wanted it to be as honest as possible you know I, I had some meeting with some meetings with some agents before meeting Jamie and a, a lot of them were sort of um, this is a bit niche it's a bit esoteric why don't you write it as though you're someone else you know fictionalize it and I thought I can't do that that is really doing a disservice to this kind of experience um, and actually we, we know that a lot more people are going through this now sadly with the advent of long Covid um, you know that's that's actually going to be on the map more now and I, I just sort of felt you know this was a 29 team project way before Covid but I just felt that 
that time we, we need to talk about this we need to you know I would like to be part of that conversation that was just giving voice to a, a different kind of illness experience and memoir rather than fiction or you know fiction as in fashioning another character to, to have my experiences felt like the most fitting kind of uh, platform. Yeah no absolutely and it kind of again maybe leads me on to my next question because I mean obviously you were a writer before you became ill so I think that, and again I think it's sort of maybe in publishing I think some people's memoirs are published because they have done strange unusual exciting things whereas I think other people turn to memoir because it's because they're writers and they want to process something through writing um, and again I'm kind of I'm kind of intrigued by, by what part of the blurb on the back cover of the book of it is um, on the inside sorry back cover is Rosie describes her memoir as being almost as accidental as her illness but insists poetry is unflinchingly deliberate a fully furnished comfort zone and again as James mentioned some of your chapters are poems I'll talk about some of those in, in a while but again in what way did kind of the, the poet or the writer in you kind of come to the kind of like you know, the, the illness in what in what in what's the connection between those two things in the book? Well, it's interesting, Helen, because I always thought if I was ever going to be a writer, whatever that means, that I would be a poet. And um, that's that's certainly what I kind of lean into as my sort of, you know, form of choice, I guess. And when I started writing what then became the memoir. I think the difference was the intention behind it. So I, I didn't actually intend when I was writing, as we as we sort of talked about in real time and, and kind of documenting my experiences, the intention initially wasn't this is going to be a memoir. It was just more maybe the questions were, can I survive this? You know, will I have to recall this one day? So I think those very initial sort of chapters serve that purpose rather than I'm, I'm going to be a memoirist I'm going to write a book so I think I came to that later you know probably in conversations with you Helen um sort of later in 2018 um when I thought actually there isn't really there aren't many people writing about this there are a few but I, I just thought within the sort of smaller industry which is kind of sickness writing sickness memoir um, there weren't that many people doing that you know tracking that experience of well I'm ill but nobody knows what it is and I don't know if I'm going to get better um, not to keep bringing it back to that I don't want to indulge that too much but uh, that was kind of my rationale behind it so I suppose the word I'd, I'd really use within that Helen is, is intention and um, the intention came later rather than uh, at the start. Oh, that's really interesting so it was kind of it was just a writer writing about yeah just writing kind of around experience because again as, as, as kind of you know Jamie's touched upon this kind of and you've touched upon as well it's, it's fragmentary in form but for me it kind of it coheres around your voice and kind of so I, I was gonna I was gonna I was just, just gonna describe you know so the chapter after fatigue which I think again I think it has this beautiful you know those I think which are absolutely you I think they're one of my favorite things about your writing is these kind of just just these ordinary details that you bring up that, that are that are both funny but also kind of poignant the um you know your auntie video calls you to show you the new kitchen tile she's had fitted and we feel we're in the realm of kind of you know we you know quite a strand of northern comedy I could hear almost Victoria Wood kind of you know using that in a comedy routine and so from that chapter, we then go to talking about my generation, which, again, I think has this kind of underlying sadness where it's kind of like you you turn to this kind of we voice and you talk about the millennials and we we as a generation and kind of one of the themes through the book is how you kind of felt, you know, that you you were always striving to be really successful, had to be you were a really driven person before your illness. But then you thought but we're not happy, our generation aren't happy. And again, I think there's this kind of humour and kind of poignancy in that chapter, you know, the kind of, um, I'm going to define my generation, well, the UK lot, at least, as those who can relate to the following. You make excited and protracted vowel sounds if Nelly's hot in here comes on. And this whole list of things, which again, is kind of like the chimney, and you go back to kind of, you remember the dial-up noises as you went online to steal an mp3 of Nelly's hot in here and, you, and then so we get that but then the next chapter mini break which you kind of almost as soon as I hear that title I'm almost kind of like oh we're in the realm of Bridget Jones here it's mini breaks but it's this elliptical poem which you know kind of you don't contextualize but it's just you know this experience again full of you know 
and so let's say you vote with your feet and they take you into a, into into space or urban countryside something you don't see every day open the tobacco tin and let the skins fly like unmarked ballot papers tiny sails for bone pin tiny tubes in puddles drifting solitary solipsistic lollips, lollipop sticks sail to a ridge and i kind of what i really love about the book is that movement of that voice between those Things. And again, obviously, I think part of that is patterning and, you know, those things might not have been written next to each other. But I mean, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Just to say a little bit more about voice and whether you think about voice, your voice as a writer at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's how we kind of define voice, isn't it? Um, and I, I did a lot of, I suppose, reflecting on this as part of uh, the MA that I, I did a couple of years ago. Um, I, I, I sort of wonder if... Um, if voice to the reader is a bit different to what voice is to the writer. So I, I suppose as a reader, I recognize voice. You know, if I, if I open a book, I can recognize the author, even if I don't know who it is. If it's, if it's an author I know, I can recognize their voice. It's a bit like, I remember someone saying this on the MA, I, it might've been Abby Curtis. Um, mm -hmm. You know, voice is like when you turn on the radio, it might be you, Helen. I can't remember who said this, but it, it you know, you recognize the artist straight away, even if it's a song you don't know, whether it's their tone or the, their pace or their use of language. I think it's the same when you open a book and you think, ah, oh, I know this person, just because it, if it's just kind of their, I don't know, turn of phrase or whatever, probably in my case, lots of swearing, uh, which I, I need to think about probably. Um, but it, it's, I think, possibly to the reader, that's what voice is. It, it's something about recognition. Voice as a writer, um, I, I think that's possibly a bit different. I, I wonder if voice is, as a writer is more about less a sort of cerebral process of, of how am I going to sound and can I sound consistent, you know, kind of across my book. It's just more a, a confidence thing, maybe just kind of, um, I don't know, giving yourself permission that it's OK to sound like you. I think like what I mean by that is I remember, you know, back in my early 20s sort of dabbling in all kinds of stuff you know poetry short stories I was like oh god if I'm going to write short stories it has to be school of Joyce or if I'm going to write poems it has to be like school of Plath because I can't possibly sound like me because that's just going to be rubbish and no one's going to, going to want to hear that but where I sort of came unstuck was probably in trying too hard to sound like other writers and I think maybe it, it, it just sort of comes to a point where you have to give yourself that permission to say it, it is okay to sound like me and it, and in doing that you're kind of recognizing yourself as a writer maybe and, and, and in that the chapters will naturally just sound like you because they are you rather than you trying to be someone else and and the feedback I've had I suppose from mates and family members who've read my book is that it, it does just sound like the book sounds a bit like having a chat with me which is what I sort of intended really and that's quite heartening to hear that's quite nice so um yes that, does that answer your question Helen when we think about voice yeah, it does. Although I, th I think you're possibly being a bit disingenuous, Rosie, because I think I, th I actually think there's a there's a huge skill in 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 translating your your own voice onto the page. And I think you know I don't think you should uh, kind of underestimate that skill. But I th and, I, and I think you do it you do it so subtly as well. I hope those kind of chapters that I kind of described and gave people a taste of show that there's this kind of movement from kind of you know but we have this sense you know and again through this you know this, this you know these very short fragments I think you know a narrative arc does emerge which you know is about the kind of you know the trajectory of the illness across the, across the time that you're writing but there's also kind of there's a family narrative in there as well I mean you know you know your final acknowledgement is to your mum and your sister Lily and you know, and I think they are you know they're so I love that I love them as characters on the page as well and you're kind of the, and, you know, and the story about you know your relationship with your dad which kind of again you we kind of get in bits and pieces and you kind of I think you're also a kind of a mistress of the art of leaving gaps of the ellipsis, which I think possibly is a you know a poetic skill. You don't give us all the background to the family relationships and the family dynamic, um, but we get a real sense of this family. Um, so yeah, so yeah, yeah, sort against of you know, I mean, did you talk to your to your mom, dad, your sister about about them appearing as characters in the book? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I did. Um, uh, Yes, and, and they were they were okay with it. I, I sort of did that as a kind of drip feed sort of project. It was like, I've got this idea and what do you think? You might be in it. Um, and that sort of, I suppose it was the pacing of it really. So I kind of wrote 
the chapters with them in. I got them to read them. I said, are you, are you OK with this? Because I'm, I'm genuinely not really going to sugarcoat anything. Um, and I hope I didn't do them a disservice in it. But they, you know, they, they kind of um, read them and sanctioned them. So, so yes, as did friends. Um, and going back to that topic of, I suppose, you know, within memoir, and within fiction, what's what's true and what is fantasy? Um, you know, some people in the memoir, for, for reasons of privacy, I have changed their names, and I kind of reference that even even within it as a sort of bit of a, a meta kind of act, really, um, to the art of, of sort of writing a memoir. And that actually, I, I couldn't put everyone in there as themselves with with their name, but uh, family members were were okay with it, which was good. Yeah, I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on the time and the numbers that we've got. We've got four questions in the Q&A. So um, again, maybe just I, I kind of, again, sort of, I know Jamie said a little bit about why he wanted to publish the book. He, he didn't think anybody else could do it better. Um, but again, I just want to, again, just reference one chapter. Um, you know, again, you do, you, as you say, you do, you do include some meta stuff in there. So it's quite a bit about writing memoir, getting a memoir published. And I just thought if maybe Jamie wanted to maybe come in again to make one kind of final comment about the kind of just how you, the, the pair of you work together, or if you wanted to kind of chat a little bit about that just for a couple of minutes. Because I, I, again, I just kind of, I love the chapter, which is how to get a memoir about a mystery illness published, inspired by actual feedback from actual agents and publishers. Don't write a memoir about a mystery illness. Write about cancer, cancer cells. Mystery illness is an unappealing topic. Make it multidisciplinary. Do an Olivia Lang and write about other people's shabby lives as well as your own. Put stats in it. Stop swearing so much. This is where you're getting the stop swearing. Don't stop swearing, Rose. The, the, the swearing is part of your voice. Yeah. <laughs> write it as a novel, not a memoir. And then, you know, don't try and be Olivia Lang. We want the next Olivia Lang, and I kind of think, you know, again, maybe if we kind of, if, it, if, if this is as this is an event about both writing and publishing, just kind of, yeah, if, if you know, just if, you know, if, if Jamie wanted to come in and just say a little bit more about kind of, you know, just you know, what is the relationship between the publisher and writer, or, you know, for you, for Valley Press, obviously, it's not for anybody else. Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, <clears throat> I think Rosie mentioned that um, she she felt like there was two paths between writing a more commercial book that uh, wasn't quite so true to herself uh, and going the agent route and, and perhaps the route of great fame and fortune, you know, and appearances on uh, Sunday brunch. Would you like that, Rosie? <laughs> we could sort that out for you. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but then we, then, or there was the route of independent publishing and the, and the focus on the product first. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning we had, um, I did a little bit of editing on it, but I was one of four people who worked on the book as an editor. And that is, uh, that is quite that's higher than usual. We also had um, uh, Neve Mulvey, who, who did uh, a lot of structural editing, and uh, Lorna Partington Walsh. I just named them in case they're listening. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, and they they did the they did a lot of mostly structural editing. I mean, if they found something they thought improved in the text, they did they made a little note of it. But mostly, it was trying to find the form of the book. And I'd, I'd really relish that as well. We did the, when Rosie submitted her first manuscript, um, I was, we, we were just about to publish a book called Dear Blacksmith, which is, uh, uh, which is it was quite, quite silly. It was written originally in bits as a blog and then reconstituted different letters and there's poems in it as well. And it's a memoir. Um, so I think we could maybe make this one of our, one of our, uh, one of our specialisms. Um, memoirs with poetry that need a bit of assembly, <laughs> some assembly required. <laughs> Do you want to say anything about that, Rosie, about the editing process? Um, yeah, it, I suppose like to go back to an earlier point about maybe what led me to Jamie, I think it's really just to reiterate that you know, Valley Press has been on my radar for a while and what you do allow authors to do is write with integrity and write in earnest rather than maybe what, what might be more of an agent's or bigger publisher's agenda, which is write what's on the zeitgeist because we want to make massive sales, you know, and I, I knew that this book had to be um, written to represent exactly my experience as it were, rather than trying to sort of tweak it to, to pander to, to maybe what agents needed it to be. Um, so I suppose with that in mind, knowing it could be quite Quite experimental that gave the form and structure definitely a sort of looser um a, a kind of looser I don't know layout really it didn't have to be necessarily linear or make a lot of sense and I think but nonetheless within that there had to be a narrative arc still and even though there wasn't a sort of 
clean, happy ending. Um, it had to sort of go somewhere and there had to be some, let's call it character development, even if the character was, was me. So um, kind of going through the editing process with, with Neve Mulvey mainly um, helped me sort of clean that up. And I remember Jamie saying, um, possibly maybe February last year, whenever it was, I think you were going to take it on, weren't you? And you just said, I, I probably know this person too well now because we'd become friends, you know, kind of after having me and I having submitted the book and, and you sort of taking it on and um, that's another thing that I really value about working with you is that you, you do establish a relationship and you've said before that you're friends with a lot of your authors and I, I kind of like that it felt it just feels honest and it feels real and um, you know Jamie was very honest within the editing process saying actually I probably would be better passing this on to someone else because um, you know that's going to cloud your, your kind of editorial judgment if you start to know the author too well so I, I really appreciate that as well. Um, and it, it, yes, it sort of took the best part of lockdown to, to kind of clean it up and, and, and make it kind of go somewhere. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, it sounds, it sounds like, um, yeah, that, that, that to me is kind of like the perfect author publisher relationship where it's, as you say, it's this kind of writing in earnest and yeah, not this, you know, as, as that chapter kind of indicates that trying to mold an author to be something they're not but rather it's you know again maybe you can yeah concur Jamie that is for you it's about kind of bringing out the book that it that you know that, it, that, it, that it's meant to be yeah 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 that's definitely um, and the, yeah the the foot that I should mention the, the third editor so there was um Neve um, Lorna and, and Sam Keenan who was uh, an in-house copy editor for the past, and me and all of us when we were working together it wasn't about it was about bringing out the real book that was inside Rosie, the best version of the book that was all Rosie's, uh, if that makes sense. Um, it wasn't about make, changing anything. It was about, it's like uh, when they said that the sculpture, like finding the sculpture inside the block of stone. That was, um, that's like a metaphor <laughs> because yeah. of the poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer the question? I forgot the question because I got this chat to that interesting. Yeah, no, just, just, yeah, just the, <laughs> the role of the publisher is, is kind of, yeah, just, yeah, with, you know, you've absolutely the answer there you've absolutely answered yeah the role of the publisher is, is about yeah shaping the book that it's meant to be rather than trying to turn it into something that you think some kind of market out there wants or that you know or that is going to make you money that's, yeah or, that's yeah. definitely what, what we did yeah um yeah and uh yeah i'm, I'm really I, I yeah i couldn't be happier with the final product um, and it's always yeah. good to be able to say that i can say that about about 80% of the time, there's nothing that could be better about the product in terms of even the printing or anything like that. But I'm, yeah, I'm 100% happy with this one. Yeah, excellent. Right, I am gonna I'm gonna turn to that. I'm gonna open the Q and A to kind of read some of the questions. I hope hopefully we'll get through all of them. Yeah. So, yeah, so the first question is for you, Jamie from Wendy. Um, great presentation. How do you balance editorial and production with marketing, which is presumably the bit that could take the longest time? Yeah, yeah, well, the the good thing, I mean, it, it's uh, uh, yeah, a good question. Yeah, <laughs> it's because uh, in theory, for the marketing, you've got forever. You think because the editing, you've got a certain amount of time. Then it's done, and then the marketing, the book comes out, and then in theory, you can keep working on it. You can keep the marketing can continue forever. You never think, well, I've no, I've told everyone in the world now about this book. <laughs> I can relax. <laughs> like, there's always more. So it, marketing goes on until the money runs out. Really, um, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's, I suppose that's the difference. The editing goes on until it's perfect. Marketing goes on until we can't afford to market anymore, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, marketing is more time sensitive because the, with the editing, we often don't start, we don't set a release date until the editing is finished. There's certainly the structural editing. Um, so there is no, there's no deadline for the structural editing. We can kick it back and forth. There's a book coming out this year. Oh, no, there's a book that we did last year that we kicked back and forth for like five years. Uh, and there's another one coming out this year, the same case, um, where it can go on. We don't set the release date because it's not quite ready yet. Um, but then once you set the release date, then, then the marketing starts because until then you can't start marketing. And then you actually have got a time limit. So uh, yeah, often, often we end up spending, because of that, and it's best to get the marketing, the best marketing done before it comes out. Um, so often the marketing is more time limited and more cash limited than the editing, especially at, at us and other maybe some of the independent publishers. Um, but it is you know it's difficult to it's difficult to balance. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I, I'm hoping to uh, build up the uh, build the budget we have for marketing and publicity over the years. That's the, um, the growing department, hopefully. Yeah, I, I guess again, that's something that bigger publishers, yeah, have whole departments dedicated to marketing, don't they? Yeah, and, and you know, we have we have a sales agency who we, we share. We share reps, one rep, one sort of sales rep for each, one for each region and one just for Waterston. And we share them with 40 other publishers of similar size, um, say it called Impress. Uh, and uh, so we're getting one fortieth of a sales team's time. And, a, and a, you know, a conglomerate, they'd have a sales team four times, four, five, ten times as big as that just for them. I suppose. Although they do more titles. There's, it's just more. It's just more man hours. You know, hours on the ground. That's um, you know, yeah, yes. That's it does make a big difference. The the, the time, yeah, resources. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's move on to the next question. Yeah, so this is a question for you, Rosie, from PJ Hale. Um, I'm in the process of writing a book that includes themes of illness and that is based on true events about my family. I've debated for some time whether I want it to be memoir or fiction. Did you ever consider writing your story as fiction? I think you maybe answered that a little bit, but is there anything you wanted to add to, to that? I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that question. And, and it probably comes more down to maybe your own assessment of what would be gained and what would be lost. Um, I sort of thought in, in writing it as fiction, I, I thought that's sort of the raw element to it and the and, maybe kind of the honesty might be lost within that. Um, I really wanted to sort of say to readers, this is actually me, you know, this is very real. This is what I've been through. I'm a real person. Um, I hear you, you know, it's a sort of almost like an act of solidarity if, if any of my readers were also poorly. Um, however, it might be a bit different if you're writing about family members because A, are they okay with it? Um, and are they gonna be okay with how they're represented? Um, and B, does, <laughs> do you feel like there would be more gained by writing it as fiction? You know, maybe it will give you that screen to hide behind and maybe be a bit more kind of experimental in what happens. Um, so it, it probably really would be personal choice and that, that personal sort of, um, you know, reflection on, on how will this serve me? What are the pros and cons of doing either? Um, and I, I don't know how sales motivated you are. Uh, you might want to base that decision on what feedback you get, maybe from publishers or agents, you know, would, would they think it was better as a as a fictional novel or, or do you think actually I've, I've, if I'm going to do this for me it has to fit me and um, it might not matter so much what what people um you know what agents might think so uh, it's probably a bit of a woolly answer really I'm sorry to be vague but probably my my thought process and my experience will be different to yours um but it there probably isn't a sort of stark answer to that um really only personal comfort zone probably um I hope that gives you a bit of clarity yeah, I think it's also this, I think, you know, as, as I think suddenly while living shows, I think memoir is a very malleable form. I think you can make it into different things. I think there's the whole scope, you know, you have sections which are poetry. I think, you know, I think, again, as Jamie said, you know, there's some memoirs which, you know, include sort of fictionalised sections and this kind of, I think there's a whole range of ways you can approach writing about real things as a, you know, as non-fiction. Yeah. that's a really good point Helen and yes it, it, just because it's a memoir you you can there is that license within that to fictionalize certain aspects of it it doesn't mean you're being dishonest it just means you know for the sake of the reader some things can be embellished a little bit or, or yeah. you know stripped yeah. away you don't have to tell the full story um you know the, there's definitely yeah. scope to do that as well so yeah no yeah. memoir is entirely unfictionalized I would say yeah and I think you know I think it is this you know you know as it's generally I think it's, it's about finding the book that something's meant to be isn't it I think that's part of the task, you know, it's like, it's, I think all writers, it's like, you think, oh, I've done it once, I can write another one now. And it's like, oh, no, this book's different. It's got to be something different because it's, the subject demands it to be something different. Anyway, I will move on with the questions. So, yeah, I've got a um, couple more questions. Yeah, so again, one for you, Rosie. How far was the memoir's self-analysis and did it help? That's hmm, one um how far was it self-analysis? I, I think there was some self-analysis that was going on incidentally that I then probably put into the memoir. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Um, that was definitely a process, but whether it was the memoir that sort of induced that or if it was just the memoir that helped that, I'm not sure. It's probably quite 
it's quite difficult to go through an illness that's that life changing without doing some soul searching and without having to you know ask the question what what do I need to change in order to bear this a bit more um so that was definitely running alongside the memoir how much they were linked I'm not sure did it help definitely because writing you know I love it I enjoy it and, and on my days when I was more lucid and had a bit more energy I, I could do it and, and just lose myself for a time so I really valued the act of writing in terms of um, helping me yeah make sense of stuff um, you know do, do a bit of sort of reflection on self and what it, what it means to be uh, living this life and all of that um, so yes it absolutely did and I was lucky because a lot of people who were poorly do not have the energy or, or the, the headspace to write at all, even if they've got a great story inside them. So I feel very, very blessed that I was still able to do that and complete that as a project. Um, I couldn't do it every day, but, but on the days I could, it was, yes, it was a, a sort of mini blessing really that I valued a lot. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to amalgamate. There's a couple more questions. There's one in the chat and one in the, one in the Q&A. So one is, are you planning another, 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 I, hang on, let me close the chat so I can read one in the Q&A. Uh, yeah, are you planning another novel and do you write full time? And then in the chat, somebody asking about whether the YSJ course helped with the memoir. So, yeah, so, yeah. Um, I, I'm planning maybe a, a poetry collection, one that I've been sort of sitting on for years and, and I've kind of sent um, hashed and rehashed copies to Jamie over, <laughs> over the years. So that might that might happen this year, possibly. Um, yes no kind of plans to write anything uh, more in the sort of fiction lane at the moment although I had an idea for a short story about someone called Jeanette with a big net who like would go around catching narcissists before they fell into ponds um that's that I don't know if that's going to happen uh, or not but <laughs> I don't know just maybe just for, for my own fun um in terms of I don't write full time and I think I'm going to have a bit of a break for a while now because it's not just the writing it's the editing as well that was all last year so I think this year I'm just going to see what happens and and not write for its own sake it, it's quite important to me that I write stuff that I really feel to go back to that word urgency that I really feel needs to be written and, and um, you know rather than just writing because I feel I should um, you know that's that's quite an important line um, that I try and walk uh, did the did the MFA or the MA help? Absolutely, uh, yes. Do it. Um, uh, having that time with Helen was was mega. Um, it, it was really really uh, just enlightening in in so many ways. Um, and to have that time actually to to complete a project um, alongside your peers um, is yes, absolutely instrumental in its development. So yes, I feel very uh, lucky to have had the chance to do that. That was that was a great pairing with with the project. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think you also, I think you were, I think you, I think you used the MFA really well, Rosie, and that you kind of that the, the stuff that where you were looking, you, you were thinking about how you wanted the book to be, and thinking about publishers and agents. I know the MFA kind of helped you think about that, didn't it? And kind of, yeah, and I think and I think you used I think you used the MA really really cleverly in that way just to kind of to take to use it as time where you could do that as well as thinking about developing the book but actually thinking about how do I get it out into the world as well. Definitely, yes. I mean, uh, sort of having those conversations on the MFA alongside conversations with Jamie, um, you know, those things sort of converged at the same time. It was using the sort of critical aspect of, of the masters to think about not only what is this memoir and what's it trying to be, but also what is the best platform for it? What is the best sort of, I suppose, um, avenue I can go down to, to get it out there? And having those conversations around, just, just being able to weigh up um, the agent route rather than the, the sort of indie public publisher route was really, really useful because they do demand different things of you. Um, and actually to be able to have have a platform to think about that and to conclude I would like to write with integrity I don't care if I don't sell a single copy this book has to be written as it is right now um, and I, I hope that doesn't sound arrogant or entitled it was more um, you know I, I don't want to, to sort of tweak it in order that it is something that somebody needs it to be to make money it has to be as it is because that's the most honest way that I can write for a bunch of readers who I think are going to pick up this book because they're going through something similar so um to have those conversations on the masters was was yeah really important for the book's development I think and eventual publication no, thanks Rosie no thanks to everybody I know we've run over time slightly so I just wanted to finish with um so I've got something in the chat. I don't know if you've read it from William. So William is out there so William was on the MFA program with uh, with Rosie um 
Uh, but Rosie was such a generous and funny classmate of mine at YSJ. It's so brilliant to read the finished book. Aren't fragmentary books, memoirs, novels, collections exactly what we want and need now? I think they are. And I think, yeah, yeah I think Valley Press and Suddenly While Living both kind of absolutely exemplify that, give us evidence that, yes, they are what we need. But yeah, so is there anything that anybody else wants to say? I'll thank everybody. Yeah. But really good thank conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just noticed, Helen, there was something else in the chat from Rachel. Um, oh, no, we've answered that. Oh, haven't we? How did the YSJ course help with the memo? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, I th I yeah. Hope, hopefully. I'm really sorry if I've missed anybody's questions. I think I've... Think I've yeah, no, I don't think them. you have. <laughs> yeah. And yes. we've, yeah, we've also got the link. If anybody wants to buy the book, book from the Valley Press website, that's up in the, the, the links in the chat as well. So I hope, we've, hope if you haven't read it already, you've kind of got a taste for it. Want to explore the Valley Press website as well for more of these beautifully put together, earnest books, which uh, is what we want. <laughs> yeah, every everyone written because they had to write it. Yeah, yeah it really, absolutely. really nailed something that last answer. Yeah, yeah. no, they those are the books it. we want. Yeah, mm. yeah, no, well. Well, thank you very much to everybody for, yeah, for this event. I've thank really thank enjoyed you, the last Helen. hour. Thank you for yeah. 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 Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for giving up your evenings to, to listen. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's really, really yeah. I, hope, I hope all the attendees have enjoyed it.